Operators in the U.S. and vendor partners are jostling for position in the 5G race. So companies like Verizon and Samsung have banded together to create a 5G technology forum to develop the 5G foundation. And that's to support the next generation of wireless technologies and services. But how far along in the development of 5G standards is our industry and how are carriers and vendors helping to foster those guidelines? Here at Mobile World Congress 2016, TI and Al will discuss 5G test trials and how standards are already being developed for a technology that promises more than 100 times the speed of our current networks and 1,000 times the capacity. In our studio right here in the Samsung booth is Ed Chan, a senior vice president of technology strategy and planning at Verizon, and Wu Jun Kim, he's vice president and the head of next generation of business and products at Samsung Networks. And gentlemen, welcome to the segment. Thank you, Abe. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Mm -hmm. Wujun, first time uh, we met. Yes. I yes. appreciate uh, giving us the space and talking about the collaboration in 5G with Verizon. Ed, we've talked before, yes. and thanks for uh, carving out some time for us. Welcome. I want to uh, just sort of tee up the conversation just by asking a real basic question that people have on their minds about 5G. How real is 5G? Wujun, I'll start with you. I think 5G, um, you know, you have to have technology and the use cases for it, and we think 5G has become real now in that um, we started working on technology for 5G five years ago. Up to, let's say, two or three year, year last year, people were saying, does it work? We think it does work. We're able to get 7, 20 gigabps of throughput, um, very low latency. But also, we're able to get, the more important thing is the use cases are coming along. That If you look at MWC this year, virtual reality, IoT, connected cars, all things beyond mobile have become very big. And those are the things I think are going to drive 5G in the future for us. Of course, Ed, a number of test trials, uh, test cases up in the Bassing Ridge, uh, New Jersey area at the, as, at the Verizon um, Center. Um, by the way, what is the name of the Verizon uh, Innovation Center? Is it Verizon Innovation Center? Uh, that's an innovation center. There are two innovation centers, in, uh, one in uh, Waltham and one in, in uh, San Francisco. Those also have 5G uh, networks uh, up there as well for the trial system. Samsung is in, uh, part of that as well. The one in uh, Baskin Ridge is our Verizon Center, is our headquarters uh, campus. Now, before we get into discussion about the test trials themselves, I want to talk about the influence that they have on guiding standardization yeah. for 5G. That's great. Thank you. Um, I would say that a couple of different approaches of, uh, to standards and, and things along those lines. We had, in the past, had always been very comfortable with you know, a, a long process where we all sit down and go through a, a pretty much uh, making as many people happy as possible and uh, along the way kind of ended up with a bit of a minimal standard at, at the end of that outcome. What I'm seeing now is that you know, with software and, and the innovations that I'm seeing in the, in the space, uh, you see that the rapid uh, creation of, of uh, innovation is coming much faster. So what we believe in is quickly get to trial, go design, refine your design, and then quickly go to deployment and then build on top of that. So we think that that's a much faster way. And then it will, as an outcome, guide the, uh, uh, the standards body with here's some real life uh, information that we got and here's kind of the de facto standard because we work together with all of our partners to say here's what we see and why we see these kind of uh, technologies and how we think the, the base layer will work. So we think that's a far better way to lead the creation of a standard and sitting back and wait till everybody's there, especially as you know some countries haven't even deployed 4G yet and we're still talking with those countries to try to figure out how do we get to 5G. So we think it's a much faster way for the countries that, uh, that already have deployed uh, 4G in a pretty massive way for us to accelerate the standard. Now, of course, Wujun, there's 5G lab trials, as I mentioned, at the Basking Ridge location. But a lot of the uh, attendees here, at, even at Mobile World Congress 2016, want to know, are there 5G deployments based on those lab trials? Yes, there are right now. Um, the lab trials have been extended to field trials. Um, and we're doing some in Basking Ridge, we're doing in other places in the U.S. Um, Korea, we're fair, doing fairly extensive trials. Um, and as we know, in 2018, the PyeongChang Olympics will be going there, and we are, for the next two years, going to be doing this quite extensively, um, and we are going to expand out. Now we're uh, talking further about the various architecture um, differences between 4G architecture and 5G. Can you sort of walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, I would say a little bit like this. If you look at 4G today, it's been evolving every step of the way. So I think that if you look at 5G, one of the big differences is that we're building in flexibility at the beginning of this. So when you look at some of the 4G discussion, which you know this as well, when we have um, uh, now adding incremental things to support things like IoT, uh, Internet of Things, 
you see how we are adding incremental things to 4G as we support those in a more, uh, a more seamless way. But 5G starts off by knowing that we, can, we need a flexible air link, and you can see those kind of things can actually start off that way. And I think also at the core side of the equation, like I said earlier, you have a lot more software capable uh, components now that you can actually flexibly create networks uh, in a much more rapid and fast way. Well, June, of course, um, existing mobile networks leverage um, different types of standards. Do they have to interoperate? And where are we on that timeline of interoperability? So I think um, you know, that's a good, really good question in that if you look at it, 2G, 3G had attempts, but they didn't really interoperate well. Oh, 4G LT was much better. And in many ways, one of the key reasons that was possible was because it brought in IP technology. Um, going forward for 5G, I think one of the key innovations is that Ed is saying is actually we're now bringing in more of a software-based, internet-based sort of term, um, focus there. And if you look at it, the internet doesn't need a huge amount of standards work. They just keep on adding things on it. And I think that's where we're going with 5G technology in that um, it's going to be standards-based, but it will be also software-based so that you will be able to do things much more rapidly. And, um, and you know, we will be working with 3GPP and the standards bodies. And it's not as if we're going to not do anything per standard. But I think it allows you to innovate that much faster, this whole software-based um, networking um, drive. Ed, I want to ask you the, the $80,000 question. Um, there's an announcement. Uh, I don't know if it was specifically Verizon, but there was an announcement that 5G would be deployed by 2017, mm -hmm. a few years earlier than, we, than that date we've heard before. Not, again, not from Verizon, but just sort of industry-wide. Mm -hmm. Is uh, 2017 still a viable date? Uh, absolutely. I think if you float around the floor, you can see the buzz that's happening. Um, I think there's a few more things we need to do, but clearly we can see a path to deployment in 2017. So I'll start off with, you can see that the uh, FCC has already worked very closely for us to get the spectrum for the carriers ready. So I think that they are clearly on the same page with us in trying to accelerate and, and make sure that the U.S. is in the forefront of the technology evolution here on 5G. Um, and then I think you also see that from an actual deployment perspective that we want to get there with some of the basic speed and, and capabilities for latency first, and then we can build on top of it, just like what Wujun has said earlier. So from our perspective, absolutely. You get it out there first, and then you innovate more and add more use case to it as you go uh, because you have now have the ability to do so with software. Wujun, how do you feel that Samsung may or may not influence um, in a positive way the 5G experience for a carrier like Verizon? Um, we will be very um, focused on making that a positive experience. Um, and I think that's one of the unique advantages of what Samsung brings, that we have in this um, um, MWC, we've announced Gear VR, um, 360 cameras, um, along with the networking gear that allows you to do that. Um, and we think that's one of the key points. We are able to bring the technology to deliver, but also we're able to bring the technology that delivers the experience that makes it worthwhile for you to do it. Virtual reality is one of them. Uh, RTVs, you know, Super UHD, 4K, 8K. Um, I've forgotten how many Ks you can get to. Um, they're all, I think, innovations. IoT is another big one we're focused on. Um, we've got our um, IoT efforts that's going across the whole company. And all of those, I think, are experiences that really enable Verizon to make a use case, a, um, a business case for really doing 5G um, sooner than later. So of course, uh, Samsung and Verizon are sort of leading the charge, if you will, in the 5G space, not only on the technology side of it or the discussion, but also on the standard side, which is very important, as we all know. So Wujun Kim, uh, thanks for being with us and giving us your time and uh, giving us a, a better picture of what to expect for 5G. Ed, as always, uh, thanks for participating. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.